Hello, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to uh, <coughs> present some of our results here. And I hope that uh, this will also be an inspiration to get input from theoreticians uh, how we could approach uh, our ideas from a more theoretical side. So today I am going to mostly present empirical results and interesting applications of uh, invertible neural networks. So um, we are dealing in machine learning with a lot of uncertainty and I would like to uh, point out some of the sources of the uncertainty we have. So the general approach what we do is we want to predict some uh, observation, uh, some parameters y that we cannot observe directly using some observable quantities x. And in the most general case, we can express this by a uh, posterior probability p star of y given x. So n star means the truth. So, but of course, we don't know the truth. We can only obtain an approximation q star, the, the best possible approximation of this p and we do this by minimizing oops, <laughs> by minimizing some loss function between q and p yeah and so that's the general approach and first i simplify a bit uh, i do not consider a probabilistic mapping from x to y but a deterministic mapping a function g star that gives the y given x um, and the first type of error is the model misspecification error. So the model class where we actually uh, optimize within, so the capital F, uh, may be smaller than the model class where the true function comes from. Yeah, and then the best possible model that we can find in our model class, F star, may not be identically identical to G star. So this used to be a huge problem in machine learning until the neural networks took over. So all methods previous to um, neural networks suffered a lot from the model misspecification. For example, linear models are just too weak for most interesting phenomena. Yeah? So then the second one is what's called the epistemic error. So we can only uh, we do not know G star, we only need, uh, know a training set, and the training set is finite, so we can never hope to find the actual best possible approximating function F star, but only some F tilde, which uh, minimizes the difference between our F and the training set. Yeah? And this is, in general, different from F star. The third error is the optimization error. So the numerics and the algorithmic limitations may not be able to actually find the global optimum, so f tilde. So, and what we actually find is some local optimum f hat, or maybe not even an optimum if the algorithm is not fully converged. Yeah, so these are the three main types of errors as long as we just look at deterministic mappings. Uh, in the probabilistic case, we have more possibilities, so the aleatoric errors arises since the axis and possibly also the mechanism p star uh, are noisy, non-deterministic. So, and in classic machine learning, uh, you use one of several tricks, for example, to optimize the uh, expectation or the uh, the maximum a posteriori solution in order to reduce it to the deterministic case. Yeah? But of course, when we reduce a probabilistic mapping to a deterministic function, we lose a lot of information, for example, about the second best solution, which may also be plausible. And had the noise been a little bit different, then the uh, second best would have won the argmax. Yeah? So uh, we call this diverse solution identification. So the sec second is the ambiguity error. In general, X does not contain enough information to fully recover Y. Uh, 
so that the inverse mapping is ambiguous and the standard classical solution is to apply some type of regularization so that the ambiguous loss plus the regularization term uh, again result in a unambiguous deterministic solution. But once again, uh, a lot of information is lost uh, by regularization uh, and especially if the regularization has no um, uh, grounding in the application that we look at. So often this is just something that's mathematically convenient but not motivated by the application and then of course what we get here is not what we actually would like to learn. So um, if we use Bayesian statistics then we can treat uh, all these error classes in a uniform manner by actually determining the best possible posterior probability in our model class. So we would like to approximate this P star as well as possible. Uh, and uh, today I am mainly or only talking about the ambiguity error. So what can we do in order to determine this posterior without using explicit regularization to reduce this to a unique solution. So here is ah, again the ambiguity of the inverse problems. So for physicists, this is of course something where you are very familiar with. So the forward problem is we have some system that we usually understand quite well. So in this case, x are the parameters of our system and then we have a physical mechanism f which produces the observations. And so here is a picture for the forward problem and the problem is that this is usually ambiguous. So uh, several x map to the same y and then if you want to solve the inverse problem given the observation y it's not clear how we should resolve the ambiguity. For example, if this y maps uh, corresponds to these two, we can take the average of the two, but this would be a highly implausible solution in this case. Yeah? So neither this nor that is close to the average. Uh, or we can just select one of the solutions here for the lower one, but then we completely lose the information that this x would also be a plausible solution of the inverse problem. Yeah? And we would like to avoid these difficulties by learning the full posterior. So here are some applications, so crystal structure uh, from diffraction patterns or greenhouse gas concentrations from light transmission spectra, 3D tissue structure from tomographic X-rays and so on. So there are tons of interesting problems that are of this type. So here is a toy problem just to illustrate um, how we approach this problem. So suppose this is the forward problem. So we have three variables x which are all normally distributed and y is the sum of x1 and x3, y1 and x2 is just a copy of x2, y2. So in matrix form this is this uh, forward mapping matrix so a linear mapping. And now we would like to solve the inverse problem. So given some observation y hat, we would like to find all x that satisfy the linear forward problem. Uh, so and this is what I already said. So since the inverse problem is ambiguous, we apply a trick. We introduce a new variable z1 here, which in this case is defined as difference between x1 and x3, and we call this the augmented observation vector. And then the matrix, the augmented uh, matrix here for the forward mapping, is now invertible, and we can just uh, apply it to the augmented observation vector in order to recover x. Yeah. Now, of course, we do not know. Uh, z because we only observe y1 and y2. But what we can do is we can compute the distribution of z in the forward mapping, which in this case happens to be a Gaussian distribution with variance 2, and then to uh, 
disambiguate the backward mapping, we can sample some z from this distribution and then insert the augmented y here, apply the inverse mapping and get one possible x. Yeah? And then we can repeat this many times, sample many different z's uh, and compute the corresponding x's and this uh, set of x's is a sample from the posterior distribution we are interested in. Yeah? Of course, in the linear case, that's not necessary to, to do all this stuff because we can compute everything analytically. But in the more interesting applications I'm showing later, that's not possible. And then we need uh, our invertible neural networks. So here, a uh, summary of what we do. So we have the forward process S of x, which is now a nonlinear function, some arbitrary complex function. And the inverse is ill post, uh, one too many. And we create this augmented problem with additional z variables, latent variables, uh, they are called. And then we find, we learn the augmented mapping from x to the augmented uh, latent space of y and z concatenated. Yeah, the y part of this augmented mapping should just correspond to the original forward problem. Uh, the z part should be chosen such that the distribution of z in the latent space is something simple where we can easily sample from later in order to create many z's and then map them back to the corresponding uh, sample of x. So, and then once we have this and we arrange such that the augmented uh, function as the augmented forward process is invertible, then we can just uh, insert our observations, sample one member from z, apply the inverse function and that's our x. Yeah, that's the idea of what I'm going to show now in more details. So here again as a graph, that's the original forward mapping, which is ambiguous, and this is the uh, augmented forward mapping, which is bijective. And we implement this with a neural network that we call a invertible neural network. So mathematically, a invertible neural network implements what's called a normalizing flow. So it maps data from one distribution to another distribution using a bijection in between. Yeah, and uh, the particular type of neural networks <coughs> runs forwards and backwards uh, with the same uh, speed, so it's no uh, preferred direction in the network. Uh, and we also have a tractable Jacobian determinant, that means we can actually compute the probabilities uh, using the change of variables formula. In this example, is the dimension of y plus the latent to the same as of x. Exactly. The, the latent space z must have uh, as many dimensions so that the total of y and z corresponds to the dimension of x. That's important. Uh, but I will later show a variation of this idea where this constraint is no longer required. So here is uh, how it works. We have uh, we use a architecture that's called the real NVP non-volume preserving architecture, which is a sequence of coupling layers. So here's just one coupling layer: x goes in, y goes out. But of course, you can stack many of these layers uh, behind each other to make a deep network. So and each coupling layer in the input splits the x into two halves. So the first, uh, so let's say x has d dimensions, so this is a vector of d over 2 and this is another vector of d over 2. Yeah? And then um, s2 and t2 are two neural networks which, are, which transform x2 to the parameters of a affine transformation which is then applied to x1. So this is the next step. 
here. And then the other way around, S1 and S2 are neural networks that use uh, Y1 in order to compute the parameters of an affine transformation for X2. So the form in formulas, this looks like this. Y1 is X1 times S2, and S2 is a function of X2, plus T2, which is also a function of X2. Yeah, and this is element-wise multiplication. So, and Y2, the same thing, only that the neural networks depend on Y1 in this case. And um, this is easily invertible. It, you just solve for X1 and X2. Yeah, so the multiplication becomes division and the addition becomes subtraction. That's it. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that these neural networks here are only ever executed in one direction, regardless of whether we execute the neural network forward or backward. Yeah, these inner networks are only uh, executed from uh, bottom to top here and from top to bottom. And this is illustrated much more clearly here in the <coughs> animation. So we split x into two halves, then process the x2 to produce the blue coefficients, then use the blue coefficients to transform x1 to the red y1, and then use the red y1 to compute yellow coefficients, and then transform uh, x2 using the yellow coefficients, and then we just concatenate the result, and that's our output of the layer. Yeah, and the inverse process just do, does everything backwards. And you see that the arrows through the inner networks are always going in the same direction. Yeah, so you can use a non-invertible neural network, or four of them, in order to create an invertible network. And that's a very clever trick. And uh, this also works very well in practice. So what we actually do is we split the coupling layer in half, so have only one transformation, so only so the x2 are unchanged, but then we stack many of them here. C's are these things, so coupling layers. And in between, we have random orthogonal transformations. Yeah, so just projection matrices, random projection matrices. Uh, and you can see the previous design with two couplings corresponds to the Q of being a permutation <coughs> matrix that exchanges the first and the second half of x with each other. Yeah? So this is a generalization and it works better in practice than the original coupling architecture. So now this uh, slide I already showed, um, the nonlinear version of the uh, inverse networks. So how do we solve this with invertible neural networks? So now the augmented transformation from X to the augmented space is implemented by our forward process in the neural network. So F theta, theta are the parameters of the network. And um, in order to ensure that the Y part agrees with the known physical forward process, we use some supervised loss Ly on the Y part of the output of the network output. And in order to ensure that the Z part follows some known distribution, we use some unsupervised loss on the Z part. And um, the fact that the augmented mapping here is invertible is automatically ensured because we use an invertible neural network. And the independence between Z and Y, which is necessary so that we can sample from Z independently of Y, uh, is enforced by the particular form of the loss that we use on the Z part of the output. So here are the losses. So we have the total loss is just three par uh, terms. So I explained Y and Z and the 
loss on x is optional. So Ly matches the y part to the true observations. Lz matches the z part such that we get a standard normal in the appropriate dimensions. And we ensure that z is independent of y, so which means that just the z distribution, uh, the joint distribution of z and y must be the product of the individual uh, distributions. And x matches the backward transformation to the distribution of the axis uh, if we know them. So this is simply backward, so the x loss is similar to what's used in a generative adversarial network again. So how do these losses look like? So the y loss is just uh, the squared loss typically. So it forces the y part to correspond to the ground truth observations. And the x loss and the y loss, uh, the z loss, are both implemented in terms of what's called the minimum mean discrepancy, which is a kernel uh, estimate of the difference of two distributions, so u and u prime. Um, but we don't know analytical um, formula for the distributions, we just have two samples from these two distributions. Yeah, and then uh, k is some kernel function here, uh, the multi-quadratic kernel, and then it compares uh, how much uh, u varies according to the kernel and how much u prime varies according to the kernel, and then it compares this to the mutual variation between the two distributions here, u and u prime. Yeah, so this is a very nice theory that has been worked out in this paper, uh, which proves that this is zero if and only if the two distributions are equal. And otherwise it's positive, so we can actually minimize it. Yeah, so what we do is we sample, uh, we take u from the ground truth, u prime from our sample distribution, and then uh, take the gradient of this expression and minimize the network parameters using this gradient. So the inference is now simple. Um, we do never ex uh, explicitly learn the backward process because it's automatically learned by learning the forward process. Yeah? They are coupled. And given some observation by hat, we sample from z, compute x hat by the inverse neural network, and x hat is unique because was z was trained, and this is the trick to capture all the information that's normally lost in the forward process. Yeah? So y has, does not preserve all the information about x, and z collects everything that's lost. And that's ensured by the requirement that y and z must be independent of each other. Yeah? That this ensures that z exactly contains the lost information. So, and we can repeat this for many samples from z and get a sample from the true uh, posterior. And we proved in our paper that when the model is perfectly converged, so the losses are actually zero, then the sample that we get from our inverse network follows the true posterior probability distribution. Yeah? Of course, in practice, these losses are never zero, and we do not yet have uh, asymptotic theory, how quickly it uh, the network converges to the true posterior. So that's one thing. I hope I get some inspiration here from the physicists. So here's one toy problem we looked at. This is interesting. It looks green. I'll show it. It's actually gray. So we came up with a robot arm in 2D with four degrees of freedom, one x1 to x4, and these four degrees are the robot arm can move up and down, and it has three joints which have some angle. Yeah. And then the robot hand lands at a particular point for each configuration of the axis, and that's the forward process. So we fix some axis and then look where the hand of the robot arm ends up. 
and then we chose some priors on the axis, so the arm prefers to be straight and in the middle. And then this stripe is where the hand typically ends up in 95% of the cases. And the inverse problem is, given some y, so this cross here is a y, we would like to know which arm configurations can we choose in order for the hand to be exactly at this position. Yeah? And this problem is interesting because uh, what we get is a bimodal posterior distribution. So the arm can go either upwards or downwards, but configurations in the middle are unlikely because that's very far from the preferred straight uh, angles that the, the arm would, would like to have. Yeah, so these are likely and these are likely and in the middle there's nothing. And this is very hard to model with traditional uh, approaches to inverse problems. So for example, if we make the Gaussian assumption about the posterior probability, then we only get one mode. And we would, in the best case, we would get either the lower configuration or the upper configuration, but never both. Yeah, that's the, a problem with classical simplifications. So, and here is what we got with our network. So this is a rejection sampling ground truth. So it's extremely expensive because we sample millions of arm configurations, only keep the ones that where the hand is at the appropriate position. But we know that this is the truth. And this is what our network gives us. So you see, uh, by and large, it's pretty good. Only in the middle, it has too much mass in comparison to the ground truth. Uh, then here, this area is what we call the re-simulation uh, re error. So given a solution of our network for the axis, then we apply, just a second, uh, then we apply these axes to the arm and look where the hand actually lands. And it does not always exactly land in the desired position, but this is the 95% region where the hand lands in reality. Hmm? You're something called the, the Z? The Z, yeah, the Z is just two dimensional in this. And that's what we're doing to get uh, this set of curves. Yeah, exactly. We okay. sample from a two dimensional Gaussian okay. and fix Y to, to this point, mm -hmm. and then we get all these different curves that are compatible with the desired hand position. So here are easier positions where we have only. Um, where we have only Unimodal solutions, yeah, only uh, the upper uh, and uh, the upper arm configuration. This uh, situation changes. Might be interesting to get <coughs> this intermediate <coughs> solution. This one here? Yeah. To cope with changes in the situation. For instance, is upper and lower, but somehow inhibited. Yeah, exactly. That. Uh, so if the if the if the probabilities change, then at least what we can do is to use our network as a for for fine tuning as a warm start, yeah, or as a prior for yet another correction network. There, there are various possibilities that we just investigate, but I don't talk about them in detail. So um, now just a few words about how we can construct these invertible networks. I already uh, showed the real MVP architecture and, and another popular variant are the, what's called the autoregressive flows, which have the disadvantage that only one direction is efficient, um, either forward or backward. But that's not so big a problem because you, you can just train two networks, one that's quick for the forward and one that's quick for the backward direction. Yeah, that's what is called a um, parallel wave net in language processing, a very famous paper. So here, the network is designed such that S is always invertible, no matter what the parameters are. 
And we have the extra benefit that the Jacobian determinant can be easily computed because uh, for each coupling layer, um, the Jacobian is just a triangular matrix. So the Jacobian is the product of the diagonal elements and the determinant is then just the, uh, the magnitude of this product. So another possibility is that we only enforce invertibility asymptotically, so after uh, infinite training. Uh, and examples for that are autoencoders or cycle guns. Uh, here we have two networks, E and D, the encoder and the D decoder, and upon convergence, so when these cycle losses become zero, so X and the encoding and decoding of X are the same, and Y and the decoding and encoding of Y are the same, then uh, necessarily D and E are inverses of each other. So that's just as good once this is converged. Yeah? Uh, the disadvantage is that for most designs we have no tractor with Jacobian determinant. And yet another one is we only approximate the invertibility and I'm going to show this on the next slide because this is especially interesting for physicists. So this is called the, the iResNet. A ResNet or residual net uh, has a particular architecture that the output of layer L, ZL plus one, is the input of layer L, ZL, plus some correction by the neural network. So that's why it's called a residual network because it doesn't try to learn the entire mapping from ZL to ZL plus one, but just the correction of ZL, yeah, the residual. And uh, when we arrange such that the Lipschitz norm of this correction is bounded, so below one, then the entire residual block has a positive Lipschitz norm and is therefore invertible. So it's usually not uh, so efficient uh, in the backward direction than in the forward direction. But a simple solution is, for example, to use the fixed point theory and do fixed point iterations. So we set our initial guess of ZL in the backward direction to ZL plus one, and then we iterate until uh, we reach a fixed point. Yeah, but other possibilities are, uh, also exist, for example, Newton algorithm or quasi-Newton algorithm, whatever. So, and then there's also an approximation of the Jacobian determinant via a power series here. Also, we found that you need quite a lot of terms for this to be accurate enough for practical application for good <laughs> convergence during training. So, why is this interesting for uh, physicists? Because it's essentially the Euler solution of a differential equation, the Euler forward solution. Yeah? So each layer of the network corresponds to one time step in the Euler scheme, and the network just con uh, computes the increments from time step to time step. And there is another variation of this called ODE network, where they actually formulate it as a uh, differential equation. And the network just learns the right-hand side of the differential equation as a function of time. And then you can use your off-the-shelf uh, ODE solver in order to uh, perform the forward processing of the network or the inverse processing if you know the adjoint operator of an F. Yeah? And then you get adaptive uh, step sizes instead of fixed layers, which may be faster or more accurate or both. So here are some of the architectures that we compared in one experiment. So I have already shown this, the invertible autoencoder. Uh, I can't talk about in, in detail. Uh, then the normal autoencoder here, the autoregressive flow where uh, the encoder is a triangular, has a triangular Jacobian. Uh, then a conditional INN, I will talk about this later. Uh, and conditional autoencoders uh, 
what's the invertible residual net is what I just have shown, the IRS net. Yeah? And this is a very classical uh, architecture, the mixture density network from the 90s, which is not invertible, but gives very good results on this particular problem. So here are the results. This is, again, the rejection sampling ground truth. This is the result of our invertible network that I have shown earlier. This is another variation that I will explain later. And here you see that the others are uh, a bit worse than the invertible uh, networks. The autoencoder is pretty okay. We will see the numbers on the next slide. Uh, but for example here, this inverse autoregressive flow doesn't recognize the bimodal distribution. It only finds the upper arm configuration and not the lower arm configuration, which is of course a very big loss of information. And the same thing for the invertible residual net in this case. So in numbers, this looks like this. So we have, uh, we measured the posterior mismatch, so the MMD between the true posterior and the recovered posterior, and we measured the re-simulation error, how accurate the hand position was found. And you see that the uh, invertible networks are the best, and this uh, mixture density networks also very good, but not comparable. Um, and the autoencoders are also sort of okay, with a bit bigger spread, but here these two are really bad. Yeah, another example so, this time, yeah. um, um, is also a four-dimensional problem where we have a little cannon and the cannon has a position, an angle, shooting angle and an initial velocity. And then the forward process simulates uh, the trajectory uh, of the cannonball using uh, gravity and air friction. Yeah, and we are interested in the point Y where the cannonball hits the ground. Uh, so in this case, Y is only one dimensional, so Z must be three dimensional. <coughs> and the principle is exactly the same. So we fix some point on the ground where the ball should land and then try to uh, learn the posterior distribution of Canon parametrization to exactly hit this point. And here you see the results. So again, the INNs are pretty good. So the conditional variation of autoencoder is very bad. It only hits always the same point, so it doesn't learn at all. Uh, and then uh, the others are more or less bad. So here, for example, this has a very, very big re-simulation error, so it doesn't really hit the desired point. And you also see this in the numbers here. Really bad results for, for these uh, methods. And the same picture for the, the uh, INNs are good, the autoencoder is good, and the MDM is good. And that's also a pattern that we see uh, in more involved applications. So it's not just restricted to the toy example. So now a real application from medicine. Um, so the surgeons are interested in the question, or I should show this picture first. Uh, so this is a minimally invasive surgery and before the surgeon can cut into the tissue, he has to clip the blood flow, so to disrupt the blood flow. Otherwise, it will be a mess. Yeah? And then he applies these clips, and now the question is, are the clips correctly placed? Is the blood flow really suppressed? And right now, you cannot see this. So what they do in practice is they cut very, very carefully, uh, just a little bit, and if blood comes out, then the clip is not good enough. Uh, and what Lena meyer hein from the DKFZ came up with is um, to use multispectral imaging in order to measure the blood oxygenation, and if the blood oxygenation is low, 
then it means that the blood is no longer flowing. So, and you see this in this false color plot. So the blue is low blood oxygenation, so the clips are in this case placed correctly. Yeah, so this is the idea. Uh, the problem is um, you, cannot, you cannot easily even define <coughs> the inverse problem from a camera spectrum to the blood, blood oxygenation. So what they did is they uh, set up a big simulation program. So they have tissue parameters like oxygenation, tissue thickness, scattering parameters, and then they do a Monte Carlo simulation, so ray tracing more or less. So they have a lot of particles that are scattered and then come out and are detected by the camera. And this is the theoretical spectrum that they get from the simulation. And then it's discretized according to the parameters of the particular camera that they want to use. Yeah, so we have here seven spectral channels. And what we want to do is we want to learn Y and Z. So Y is the spectrum, Z are latent variables such that Z is normally distributed so that we can settle from Z, take some observed spectrum and get the tissue parameters X back. So here's what we get. The first row is again a rejection sampling, ground truth, so even more expensive than in case of the, uh, of the robot arm. And these are three neural network variations, so our invertible network, a conditional variation autoencoder, and here a Bayesian neural network using dropout inference. Um, and you see that the INN gives the best results, namely here. It correctly detects the skewedness of this parameter volume fraction, so blood volume fraction. So it cannot be more than 100%. So it must be a skewed distribution, whereas the other methods have a symmetric distribution, which also predicts values that are physically impossible. Yeah. So here, this is also, I, I should for, first say that uh, the, the mode, or a very likely value at least, corresponds to the ground truth. So this uh, dotted line is the ground truth, which our method tries to hit. So here is also a very interesting finding. Um, it turns out that the tissue thickness and anisotropy parameters cannot be recovered from the light spectrum. And we see this in our estimate because here the posterior distribution, the blue one, is exactly equal to the prior distribution. So we have not learned anything by observing new data. Yeah? Whereas in the alternative methods, we have a peak distribution. It has a big uh, variance, but still a marked peak. So this, these methods still think that they have seen something. Yeah? Whereas our method uh, tells us there is nothing to be seen. Uh, and the third thing is the correlation. So the true correlation is best recovered by our methods. Uh, the dropout Bayesian network doesn't <laughs> find any correlation between the parameters. And uh, the conditional autoencoder finds a positive correlation where actually there's negative correlation or almost no, no correlation. Yeah, so you see that um, the loss apparently after our training was small enough for the um, estimated posterior to be close to the true posterior, which is measured here by the rejection sampling. So then another application of this method is um, design of experiments. So which camera is the best choice to detect blood oxygenation? Uh, and our collaborators tried three different cameras, so a standard RGB, then one camera with eight spectral channels and one with 27 spectral channels. And of course, this is really, really expensive. So you wouldn't like to use this 27 channel camera if you don't have to. So, and then since our method gives us full posteriors, we can analyze the uncertainty 
of each of these cameras in the oxygenation parameter. So, and one uh, finding is so for the RGB camera that uh, some of the results are multimodal. So, it does, cannot, cannot decide which oxygen, oxygenation is right. And here, the biggest mode is not the one that's close to the ground truth. So, this is not good. Um, then, here, also the RGB camera has a very large variance. It's also too much uncertainty for the surgeon to be sur uh, sure that he can cut into the tissue. So that's also not good. And here, for the eight uh, channel camera, you get very nice unimodal uh, narrow posteriors. So this is the result that one would like to have. And uh, it turned out that the 27 channel camera is not much better in this respect. So considering the price, the eight channel camera is the camera of choice. So, okay, so now this was the uh, invertible neural network. Now we come to another design which we call the conditional invertible neural network. Um, so this is the design so far. We have X space and then the augmented space of Y and Z, which must match dimensions. But that's often not possible. So for example, we consider a environmental physics application where we have two parameters, the uh, carbon dioxide and uh, methane concentration in the atmosphere. And then from the satellite, we can uh, compute, uh, we can observe 200 at uh, 2000 spectral channels. So uh, Y has more dimensions than X. So we cannot have Z here. So what we do now is we move device out of the network and condition the network on device. So now we only have a mapping from X to Z. X and Z have the same dimension, two in this case, and Y is a side input that, so to speak, selects the most appropriate network uh, for the given Y. Yeah? So for every observation Y, there is an optimal network that computes the correct posterior, and Y just selects among these infinitely many networks. So here is the architecture. What we do is we have the condition, then there's some pre-processing feature detection, more or less. And then these features are fed into the S and T networks of the coupling layers and just modify how the lower part is mapped to the transformation parameters. Yeah? That's the idea. So here um, is how we train this thing. So here is the change of variables formula. So the posterior of x given y is the distribution of z uh, at the point that is determined by the forward mapping of the network. Yeah, so we map forward and then look up in the Gaussian distribution what the corresponding probability uh, density is. And then we must adjust this probability density by the Jacobian determinant in order to account for possible changes of local volume. Yeah? And uh, if we take just the logarithm of this and uh, or the negative logarithm of this and minimize the negative logarithm, then we get a very simple uh, optimization problem. So we sum over the training set and we try to minimize the squared uh, outcome of the forward process. So that's the logarithm of the Gaussian. Yeah? So it's just the exponent of the Gaussian minus the logarithm of this uh, Jacobian determinant. And this is very easy to compute thanks to the uh, Jacobians being triangular by construction. Yeah? And we just iterate this in the usual manner for neural networks do the gradient descent step and that's all the training. And then to predict, uh, we just sample a z from the Gaussian, insert it here, insert the observation here, compute the inverse network, and that's a sample from x. 
Yeah, so here's a graphics. So here comes the observation. We train X forward process to a simple distribution. So this is the, called the target distribution, and this is the reference distribution. That's the training, and in uh, generation or inference, we run the thing backwards. So here is one application, colorization. Uh, the problem is given a grayscale image, which is the Y, so the observed data is the grayscale image. Um, create a color image for that particular grayscale image. And since we can sample from Z, each Z should give a different colorization. Yeah, so this is the main difference between our method and other colorization uh, methods. Typically, these methods only give a single color image and not a set of diverse colorizations. Yeah? And our method in this particular case works so well that it's not easy to recognize which one is the true uh, color image from the uh, test data set. Yeah? So this is the image net data set and one of the nine pictures is the true one. So would you like to, to guess? Which one? Yeah. This in the middle? No. This? No. Right. This one? <coughs> yeah. So who is for this one? No, not sure anymore. Who is for this one? Okay. <coughs> for this one? <laughs> okay. So the solution is. This one. <laughs> so I mean, we have we have done this quiz a lot of times. So humans have a better performance than guessing. Also, here in the audience, it was <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> so here's how the network looks like in detail. So first, we feed the gray level image to a standard neural network which performs feature detection so this could be a VGG network yeah and then we cut the VGG network at some interior layers and say these are the features the interior activations so this is a very standard uh, approach of training this and then we have here during training we know the color image so we have the color channels here in LAB color space um, and then we feed the color channels into the uh, invertible network. So these are convolutional um, coupling layers and they are parameterized by some function of the features of the gray image. Yeah, so here are the features and then we transform the features in a way that's appropriate for each coupling layer. Uh, and then a convolutional coupling layer just means that the S and T networks are convolutional neural networks so rather than fully connected. So, and then we have many of these and then we have downsampling steps in between uh, which perform a wavelet transformation. So a set of four pixels, two by two pixels is transformed into a one pixel with four channels. Yeah, this is Okay, called the wavelet transform if you use these particular uh, kernel functions in order to apply the transform. And then we just take the downsampling layer, this one here, the average layer, and processes further, uh, whereas the other outputs of the wavelet transform are just uh, kept as is and concatenated to the Z vector. Yeah, so these contain the details and these contain the, uh, no, the high level information, so the coarse scale information. So here are more examples. This is the gray scale image and these are some of the color images that we got. Uh, in the paper we also have a large collection of failure cases. So here you could argue that the color of the mushroom is not constant, which may or may not be possible in nature. 
but it, uh, by and large, it's pretty good. Here's a in interesting experiment, how the latent space is structured, so the Z space. So we sample one particular Z, which whose um, length, the length of the Z vector, corresponds to the expected length of the Z vector. Yeah, so it's uh, what's it, 8,000 8, dimensional, so it has a length of 8,000 is the expected length in uh, no, square root of 8,000 is the expected length in Z space. So then we get a nice color images, and then we take the same Z vector but shorten it by to 90%, 70%, and to zero, and to see that the image desaturates. But interestingly, you don't get the grayscale image, but at z equal to zero, you get some kind of a default colorization. So because vegetation tends to be greenish, birds ten tend to be brownish, so a little bit of this default color is still present in the center of the z-space. And in the other direction, if we enhance Z, then we get oversaturation. So, but the interesting thing is that the colors are consistent. They are just getting more strong yeah, from left to right. It's not, not some chaotic change of colors. And this can be used to do, um, to do color transfer. So this is our grayscale image that we want to colorize. And this is a... Um, now, a source image, so we would like to take the color from the source image, but the geometry from the target image. Yeah? And what we do is we uh, apply the forward network to these target colors, and then use the z-vectors that we get, and apply the backward uh, process of the network with these z-vectors. And then you see that the colors are transferred. Of course, this only works if these images are sufficiently similar. Otherwise, the z-space structure will be too different, incomparable. But still, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that uh, what you see is that the color doesn't leak out of the car, which is a big problem if the method is not perfect. Yeah? So the colors leaking out or colors changes in the middle of a homogeneous uh, region. Okay, so I should come to the end. <coughs> so I have shown you two approaches to solving ill post problems. The direct approach, where we uh, augment the output space y with a latent vector z so that it matches the dimension of x. Or the statistical approach, where we learn a mapping from x to z. z, z has the same dimension as x parameterized by the observations y. Yeah? And in both cases we get uh, the true posterior uh, when the network is perfectly converged. Uh, and we do get diverse solution because we have a posterior and not just a deterministic single solution. Yeah? Uh, then we have many ideas for future work. So we would uh, not just have a, like to have a Z space that works well, we would like to have the Z dimensions to have meaning so that we can explain to a human what these Z dimensions mean. Yeah? So what, they, what their action is on the image. And we have new results that I don't have in the, in the talk for the MNIST digits where every Z dimension has a very distinct effect on the generated output. So one Z dimension uh, correspond, uh, controls the height and one controls the slant and so on. Yeah, then um, we would like to combine multiple observations. So if you measure Y several times and Y is noisy, then the more uh, measurements for Y you have, the more accurate the distribution of x should become, so the narrower. Yeah, that's a problem that we have not yet solved uh, satisfactory. We would like to extend this to the unsupervised setting, so we do not have uh, y's, or we would like to learn the y's along the way, for example, the classes in, uh, in MNIST. 
and we would like to find more applications. One application I didn't show, which is in the making, is this application to environmental physics, where we um, take spectra uh, from a satellite and then estimate the CO2 concentration and the methane concentration along the ray that reached the satellite. Yeah, so then it remains to thank the team and to thank you for your attention.
some more questions. Uh, is there more questions? I was, I was wondering whether you think it would be interesting to to compare on some like toy example of the inverse problem on which we know very well what optimal algorithms are, say on like compressed sensing or sparsely linear sparse linear estimation. How well your your algorithm does in terms of you know the fine-tuned optimal mm -hmm. optimal algorithms for those problems? Just to get like a yeah, so we did such an experiment with a linear Gaussian model. Um, and there the estimates are extremely uh, accurate. So it's a paper that is just under revision, so not yet published. Uh, so I have included it here. Of course, it's not my own paper, I'm just a co author. Um, yeah, so in this case, where we know the correct results. So so you have linear equations in Gaussian noise. Yeah, and then you can just analytically invert everything yeah, and uh, compute the posterior, which is also a Gaussian analytically, and to, you know the mean and the covariance matrix of that Gaussian. And our networks reproduce these very accurately up to 500 dimensions, which is the biggest problem yeah, we tested. Yeah. But that's just the Gaussian problem that is yeah, but, factible, but something where computing the partition function or something the posterior is, is sharp and hard. Or for instance, the sparse linear regression would be a yeah. case like that. Because you have the statement at some point that if the losses are zero, then you're exactly something the posterior. But for many posteriors, we know that this is a hard problem, so this cannot be like so, so simple. Yeah. So in some of the problems where we know that something the posterior is hard, Yet we have a good idea of what the optimal parent algorithms are. To know, I mean, yeah. what what you said is a, is is going in that direction, but it's a too easy example. It's just Gaussian posterior example. Just yeah, just I would like, like to go after after the talk in the detail about this di okay. discussion because we had a hard time coming up with interesting problems <coughs> where we still know the truth analytically. So most problems we looked at, we have no ground truth, analytical ground truth, so we can't really tell how yeah, close we are. Yeah, yeah, so if you have a good problem where we know the solution, then... So we can thank the uh, again.